Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Angelina Godoy, and I am the Helen H. Jackson Chair in Human Rights here at the University of Washington and the Director of our Center for Human Rights. So thank you so much for being here, all of you. I'm here tonight to present our center's two latest research reports about deportation flights on ice air, both nationally and from King County. Uh, those reports are also available online, um, and I encourage you to consult them there and share them widely. We're also here today to hear uh, from three distinguished panelists, and I want to welcome them as community leaders with rich perspectives to share about the importance of these issues. They are also people who contributed directly to the research that we are here today presenting, so in many ways their insights have already enriched our perspectives that are brought forward in the reports themselves. I want to go ahead and introduce them right now. I apologize, we're not, si we're not having them sit here where you can see them while I introduce them, uh, mainly because there's a blinding light from the projector that would hit them right exactly at eye level, and we want them to survive this <laughs> encounter this evening, so they will come up and speak in turn. But I'm going to go ahead and introduce them um, in the order that they will be speaking, which is the same order as on the poster and promotional material for this event. So I will speak first, and I'll present our research, and then I will hand it over to Hamdi Mohammed. Hamdi was born the youngest of 10 siblings in Mogadishu, Somalia, and a year later she fled Somalia with her family as the Civil War broke out. She came to the United States when she was three years old. Today, Hamdi is a graduate of the University of Washington with a degree in Law, Societies, and Justice. Any LSJ people out there? <laughs> and she splits her work. Uh, she works for uh, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, and she splits her work in uh, Congresswoman Jayapal's district office and her campaign office. In the district office, Hamdi is the director of constituent services, where she helps people navigate the everyday impacts of public policy and addresses constituents' issues relating to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Department of State, and in that capacity, she has been extraordinarily helpful to us here at the Human Rights Center. She's also often finding herself writing letters for stay of removal for those facing deportation and requesting expedited adjudications on immigration applications, so she's intimately familiar with the concerns uh, that arise in those processes. Part of her job is also educating and acting as a conduit between citizens and federal agencies. She's also Congresswoman Jayapal's campaign manager and is responsible for overseeing all aspects of the campaign, the management of staff, the coordination and implementation of all fundraising operations. So she's got a lot on her plate <laughs> and we're very, very lucky to have her not only representing us here in this congressional district but here with us tonight uh, to share her perspectives on these issues. Uh, after that, we will hear from Bun Tai Chim, who's a 1.5 generation Khmer American, born in the Khao Idan refugee camp. He, is, he describes himself as a Holly baby, or a past resident of Holly Park, the predecessor today, to today's New Holly neighborhood in southeast Seattle. Bun Tai is a storyteller, and he focuses on centering the voices of marginalized communities in his work. To that end, he has told stories through poetry, as an actor on stage and in film, as a playwright, and through journalism. His articles have appeared on Crosscut, The Seattle Globalist, The South Seattle Emerald, and The International Examiner, where he was part of the inaugural cohort for their Advocacy Journalism Fellowship Program. He's also a community organizer with the Khmer Anti-Deportation Advocacy Group of Washington. And he also volunteers for the Cambodian American Community Council of Washington and the Coalition of Immigrant, Refugees, and Communities of Color. So also a person who can speak with great expertise to the issues that arise in the context of deportations right here in King County. And lastly, we will be hearing from Maru Mora Vialpando. Maru is an activist and an undocumented immigrant. She was born and raised in Mexico City, and here in the United States, she has spent many years focusing on racial justice and immigrant rights. Currently, she leads La Resistencia, the organization formerly known as Northwest Detention Center Resistance, where the group's main focus is to shut down the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma while gaining better treatment and conditions for all undocumented immigrants held there. Maru has been an outspoken activist and has been upfront about staying in the United States after her <coughs> visa expired. And in December of last year, in direct retaliation for that outspokenness, Immigration and Customs Enforcement put her in deportation proceedings. 
Despite these challenges, Maru Mora is undeterred and she continues her advocacy work and she was recently selected as the 2018 Globalist of the Year at the Seattle Globalist Film Globy Awards celebration. But when she asked how she would describe herself, she said, I'm a single mom and a community organizer. So I'm very grateful to all three of those folks for being here. And then there's another set of folks I want to acknowledge with particular gratitude. Um, and I, they are too numerous for me to introduce each of them with all of their qualifications. But those qualifications shine throughout the work that the Center for Human Rights has published on this issue. All of our work at the Center for Human Rights is powered by student researchers, and this project is no exception. So the research reports that we are presenting tonight draw heavily on research conducted by undergraduate members of a Jackson School task force that I taught last quarter, most of whom are here tonight. That's Task Force D. Will you guys stand up and let us acknowledge you? Thank you. OK, so no more introductions. Before I dig into the research that I keep saying I'm going to talk about, I want to also acknowledge something else uh, that many of you may already have heard, uh, because it was front page news. Yesterday, Dow Constantine, <laughs> King County Executive, issued an executive order expressing his intention, his goal, of banning all deportation flights by private charters at Boeing Field. That deserves a round of applause. Though. So some people have asked me how that changes what we're going to talk about. That's, executive order came as a huge surprise to me yesterday, as uh, some of you who were with me in the moment I received the news know. Um, you could have pushed me over with a feather. Um, so did this, does this change what we're going to talk about? Well, actually, from my point of view, it doesn't. Uh, the executive order is long on vision. It embraces a beautiful vision that I'm happy to get behind. It's bold and beautiful, and it's, um, it, it, it articulates with eloquence King County values, but it's very short on specifics. It commands, for example, county officials to take all appropriate measures to limit collaboration with deportation flights. That sounds good. <laughs> what are those appropriate measures? The devil is always in the details. And so that's what I believe makes tonight's discussion more important than ever, right? And ongoing research and advocacy on these issues is more important than ever. That executive order is the first of its kind in the nation. So now it's on us to make sure we do not rest until the bold principles and visions articulated there are brought down to concrete policies and we stop those flights because the entire rest of the country is watching for us to show them it can be done. So how do we do this? Well, first, we have to learn how the flights work. And that's where the intimate and boring details that I'm about to expose you to come in. That's what I want to talk about tonight. And then we have to learn to fight like hell. And I think we have three excellent panelists that can tell us how to do that and give us lots of tips and enlist our services in following them uh, forward in that task. So. With no further ado, let me take you into the machinery of mass deportation uh, that is ICE Air. And before I do that, I want to say a few words about how we got this work underway to begin with. So we began this research in 2018 in response to requests from community partners, indeed some of the partners that are here today or that are represented here today, because members of immigrant communities here in King County have long known about deportation flights happening at King County International Airport or Boeing Field, right? Folks know that their family members are taken there and shipped out of the country. And many have long wondered, how is this possible if Boeing Field is a publicly owned and administered airport and we are supposedly a sanctuary county, indeed one, have most, one of the most progressive sanctuary ordinances in the nation? How is this happening? So that was our first research puzzle that we set out to investigate. And it's still reflected in the report's title of Hidden in Plain Sight. In a way, there's sort of a paradox around deportations that we learned as we did this work. You know, we all know deportations are happening. Our president mentions them on the daily. Everybody knows these are there are flights taking people to other countries all the time. Um, you can go to Boeing Field and see with the naked eye images like this, which was taken just weeks ago by uh, one of our student photographers. Uh, you can track the flights online if you have access to the internet. Anybody can. Um, 
it's, it's an open secret, it's not a surprise, and yet, strangely, or perhaps not so strangely, the mechanisms by which people were being placed on those planes, the business relationships through which people are profiting from the moving of bodies into those planes and across the country and out of the country, had remained largely secret and shrouded in secrecy until now. And that's why we think this research is important and this particular moment is important to talk about those mechanisms. So we started out by filing a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, and through that last year we obtained a copy of ICE's Alien Repatriation Tracking System. It's a database that contains over 1.7 million records. Each of those records, and you can scroll through it and keep scrolling through it and keep scrolling through it and keep scrolling through it, and each of them represents an individual person shackled at hands and feet and dragged across a tarmac and forced onto a plane somewhere in the United States between fiscal year 2011 and fiscal year 2019. So when we first got that database, which ICE itself gave to us through FOIA, we then complemented that with public records requests in four different US states and three different foreign countries, a raft of interviews and the analysis of publicly available documents and the very hard work of the students you recognized earlier was made it possible for us to draw the conclusions that we are sharing with you tonight. So what this map here shows is the ICE Air flight paths within the United States. These are paths taken by private planes chartered through a web of public and private relationships that profits off the detention and deportation of migrants. And we have a whole report on the national data and what that reveals, but I want to save the time I have, the brief time I have with you tonight to talk specifically about what it tells us about what's happening here in King County. So this chart refers to King County. During this same period from 2018, from, I'm sorry, 2010 to 2019, almost 35,000 people were directly deported through Boeing Field. And as you can see in these numbers, the the rate of deportations through Boeing Field fluctuates over time. These numbers map roughly, or the rates map roughly onto national figures. But on average, 350 passengers uh, were removed from King County International Airport every month. So where do those flights go? Well, some of them are direct removals. There have been flights that leave Boeing Field and land in Guatemala or in China. But most, the overwhelming majority, in fact, are indirect flights. They are transfers to deportation hubs that ICE maintains, just like United Airlines or American, they all have their hubs. Well, ICE's hubs are along the southern border or in the southern states of the United States. There's five different hubs. You can see uh, some of them reflected here on the map. From those hubs, they're either placed on another plane and flown abroad, or in the case of Mexican nationals, they're often bussed directly across the border. And also some people are relocated to another detention center. So from these places, some people are taken to be locked up in another part of the United States. And in this way, it's impossible to separate the flights from the detention centers themselves. This is a window into the profit-making enterprise of housing and moving bodies. And there's also flights coming into Boeing Field. Now those flights tend to be lighter in terms of passengers because this is the business of deportation, but there's also people being brought into our county, presumably to fill beds at the Northwest Detention Center, where as you may know, there's a bed quota of 800 people per day, providing an incentive therefore for ICE to shuffle people around the country in order to fill those beds. So as this map shows, where are people coming to KBFI or Boeing Field? They're coming from those border areas. What this means is that the border is here. It's right here. So when you read the news about what's happening on the border, when you read about family separations and children being pried from their parents' arms and asylum seekers being incarcerated, those people, they're coming here. And so we shouldn't afford ourselves the luxury of thinking that because we live in progressive King County, those issues aren't happening here. They are. And that's what this data shows. Our county is intricately enmeshed in a national network of deportation and incarceration and providing a platform for profit making from those processes. Now the bulk of the detainees, or deportees if you will, are from Mexico and the countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, often referred to as the Northern Triangle of Central America. By overwhelming numbers, uh, those are the majority of those who are being deported. But we also see growing numbers of deportees in particularly the, just the last couple of years from other long-standing communities in King County. 
um, including Cambodians, Somalians, and many others who came in some cases as resettled refugees, only now decades later to face deportation. There are many, many human rights concerns that arise in this process, and the data that we have gathered sheds new light on some of them. As some of you may have heard, there are accounts of, few and far between, but there are accounts of atrocious physical violence transpiring on the planes themselves. The most famous of these is the account of a failed deportation flight uh, in December 2017 to Somalia that wound up, didn't even make it all the way to Somalia, but in Senegal it stopped and was held on the tarmac for 23 hours, during which time the detainees remained shackled, as they do on all these flights for the entire time. Uh, they were physically beaten, some of them were dragged down the aisle of the plane, others were tasered, some were put in full body, body um, restraints that detainees describe as body bags. Uh, others were subjected to other forms of physical violence, denied access to the restroom, some were forced to soil themselves in their seats. What's unusual about that flight is that it returned to the United States. It went so drastically wrong that ICE decided to turn the plane around and bring those folks back to the US and many of them filed a lawsuit as a result. That's what makes it unusual because we know about it. There is no mechanism by which <coughs> passengers on other flights can report what happened to them. We have no way of knowing how common those accounts of that Somali flight are. Of the interviews that we conducted, we heard about routinely racist, degrading treatment, even here um, on the tarmac of Boeing Field. So I think we shouldn't focus only on these egregious accounts of physical abuse, not only because we don't know how widespread they are, but because it obscures the violence that is deportation itself. Right? Family separation is deportation. The, the wrenching of people from their family members and forcing them onto planes <laughs> to a country that many of them have never even known is a form of violence. And this data sheds new light on due process concerns that often arise in that process. Strikingly, in fact, ICE's own database contains a column titled status where they register the deportability of the individual in question in a series of alphanumeric codes. And through our analysis of those codes, we found that of the people deported from King County, some 157 on direct removal flights were being removed despite having pending appeals before the US courts. That means those deportations are unlawful. Those people have not exhausted their legal process in the United States, and they're nonetheless being put on a plane. And when I asked immigration attorneys about this, they all knew cases like that. It's not rare. In fact, that 157 is probably a drastic undercount because, as I said before, so many of the flights are internal transfers and we're being conservative with these numbers only counting direct removals. In addition, some 2,615 people deported through Boeing Field had no access to the courts whatsoever throughout their process. This should not surprise us. Most of the people being deported in this country now are deported through a variety of processes called expedited removal and associated with expedited removal, which means they are never entitled to a hearing for judicial review of their case for a judge to hear what happened. And this is all inscribed in the data that we reviewed. So how does this happen? Well. This is a complex <laughs> chart that we took a lot of time trying to figure out ways to clarify, to show the relationships between private and public entities that make this possible uh, right here in King County. I want to be clear, the county itself does not have a contract with ICE, but what the county does is it rents space to private companies, which are called FBOs, or fixed base operators. They have hangar space at King County Airport, and this is true at other airports throughout the nation. King County is not unusual. Clay Lacey Aviation, which has recently been bought by Modern Aviation, is the principal FBO involved in profiting from deportation flights, which are carried out by private charters at King County International Airport. Those FBOs are the entities that are profiting from the flights, which are contracted through a series of co contracting and subcontracting relationships. So you see ICE there at the top. They have a single air a uh, charter broker called Classic Air Charter, which is in charge of organizing and coordinating all of these flights across the nation and the world. They, in turn, hire private companies to run the planes, to staff the planes, to, to, to shackle the folks being put on them, and to provide uh, all the associated support with that process. Those companies, in turn, do business um, with FBOs, like here at uh, King County Airport, Clay Lacey, and the airport itself, 
uh, derives income from those companies' rental of hangar space to facilitate those activities, as well as from landing fees and fuel charges uh, associated with deportation flights. And the airport, King County, is legally responsible for overseeing their operations, ensuring that they are safe and lawful. Yet, yeah, as we learned in this process, you can see here this is just one example of an invoice uh, filed by King County uh, to Swift Air, which is the number one private charter operator in this uh, segment of the U.S. market. The county has conducted no inspections, no audits of these companies' operations, despite the fact that they have the right to do so under the terms of their contract. They routinely renew leases for as long as 35 years without ever having ever engaged in any effective oversight of their practices. So I'm gratified to hear that the county is expressing an intention to change that. The fact that their records, however, are so sorely lacking or that their process of making public the records that they may have uh, leads us to be cautious about embracing those intentions until we see concrete results. This is just a screenshot from one of the databases that we are working with in which I cross-checked or cross-referenced the ICE Air database that we got from a ICE with the records we got from King County about uh, flights coming in and departing from King County. And what you're seeing there on all those yellow bars are flights that ICE records show went through King County and that King County claims it has no records of. But as I said, you can track this all on the web. In fact, somebody set up a Twitter account that enables you to, and I would suggest you follow it, because in the days that come, there will be more deportation flights. There was one yesterday. There may be another one later this week. There'll certainly be one next week. Well, I shouldn't say certainly. These things are unpredictable, but there's likely to be one next week. Um, and I think we need to be aware of this. I think we need to be demanding results from the county and no better way to do that than to make ourselves aware through our own trustworthy mechanisms of what's happening. This is one way to do it. You can get notifications sent directly to your phone. Please follow it. <laughs> Sorry? What's the handle? The handle is Ice Air KBFI. I will leave my comments there, although I look forward to any questions or comments that others might have, but I want to give time to my esteemed colleagues um, to come up and speak. So please join me in welcoming Hamdi Mohammed. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Professor Godoy and the UW Center for Human Rights for the hard work that you guys have been doing um, and for shining a light and exposing the harsh conditions that um, folks are going through. Um, it is so important that this work is being done, um, that we expose U.S. Immigration Customs and Border Patrol um, uh, Enforcement, ICE. I see my prof old professors in this room, Chief Professor Steve Herbert and Catherine Buckets is in here. And um, it feels like a full circle uh, graduating from the University of Washington and being in this room today. I just want to say that because it's flowing through my head as I speak. <laughs> um, that said, um, I'm glad to be here to be discussing something very important and something very personal to me is deportations to Somalia. As you guys heard, I came to the US as a refugee when I was three years old um, and fled Somalia with my family. And so to be covering this, is it's very personal um, and very close to my heart. Um, Somalia has been affected by decades of civil war, political violence, and humanitarian crisis. Today, Al-Shabaab, which is a, a known terrorist group, has used many forms of violence to take control of the region. Um, and they've been doing that since 2006. On October 14, to, uh, 2017, Mogadishu, the capital city of Somalia, experienced one of the deadliest terrorist attacks. Um, that has been seen in the recent history of the world. The Associate Press reported that 500 people were killed, 300 wounded. Um, just last month, in one week, there were seven different car bombings that happened in Mogadishu. Um, in the last few years, the country has experienced what has been called the worst droughts and famines in, uh, in the 21st century. So if you guys see on the State Department uh, website, it says, 
do not travel to Somalia due to crime, terrorism, kidnapping, and piracy. It is a level four country, which is basically the highest threat level a country can be scaled at. But despite the warnings issued by our U.S. Uh, Department of State, ICE is continuing to deport folks there. In a report that was released um, to our office um, by ICE, it showed that over 500 individuals were deported to Somalia in 2017. That, uh, that number was triple the number from 2016. Many of the individuals who are being deported were raised um, in refugee camps outside of Somalia and, um, and sought asylum in the United States um, as refugees who were fleeing persecution and violence. Many of the individuals have family members who live here in the United States. Um, they've lived in the United States for decades themselves. Uh, some of the folks who have been deported to Somalia do not even uh, speak the language. They're not fluent in Somali anymore because they've been here since they were kids and uh, don't have uh, family connections there anymore, which make them very vulnerable to militant violence. Somalia is experiencing food water crisis that compromise human rights, in addition to overwhelming turmoil and conflict. Uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee has urged countries, from refrain, urged countries to refrain from forcibly removing um, individuals who have entered a country as a refugee back to, to Somalia, <coughs> specifically, actually. Um, they say that uh, any area that has been uh, affected by military action or is ensuing displacement remains uh, fragile or insecure after military action or remains under or partial control of non-state armed groups. And that's essentially what Muqtisha is. But ICE is continuing to deport folks there. Due to the conditions in the region, these deportations are violating the following human rights treaty and customary laws. The 1951 uh, Refugee Convention and the 1967 pr Protocol, which basically says that a refugee should not be returned to a country where they face serious threats to their life and freedom. As well as the UN Convention Against Torture, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, um, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly to promote the respect of individual uh, civil and political rights among all committed parties, the United States. Um, and those rights include the right to life, the right to freedom, uh, and also the right to due process and fair trial. And that's one of the things that we're seeing now happening is where folks are being deported um, when they have pending appeals in court. Today, many Somali refugees, as you heard Professor Godoy say, um, allege that U.S. immigration authorities have treated them with cruelty on deportation flights. And you guys have to think, like, these flights to Somalia are not short flights. It's 24-hour travel times we're talking about. Um, they are reporting being kept in handcuffs, you know, being shackled without food, water, limited access to lavatory or no access. Um, in a court document, a fellow Somali deportee states, and I quote, um, when the plane's toilets overfilled with human waste, some of the detainees were left to urine in bottles or on themselves. In a BBC report, a fellow Somali deportee alleges they all experienced the following abuses, and I quote, being maced, with the gas, being threatened to be killed. While we were in shackles, they were just throwing us against the wall and on the ground. Many of the folks who have been deported, like I said, uh, have family members who are US citizens, right? And their family members are not even being notified of when these flights are gonna take off. They don't know when the deportation flight dates are. They can't even say bye or make any sort of plans for wherever that person may be going. And that's a problem. Um, 
A U.S. citizen mother shared with me her personal story about her son being deported to Mogadishu, which she essentially described as a death sentence. She said he had no money, no one to welcome him there. She was devastated. She was in tears. And then she asked me if I could imagine what it would be like just being blindfolded and being put on a plane to Mogadishu. And I told her I can't imagine that because I just can't. Um, these deportations are impacting U.S. citizen families across this country. It's obvious that these deportations to Somalia would lead, will lead to the persecution and hardships of hundreds of deported Somalis. And it is, you know, the United States has a moral and political obligation to avoid returning refugees to areas of extreme conflict. These deportations are violating international laws and that seek to protect folks who come here as, as refugees, you know. So we've urged ICE to hold to all deport deportations to um, Somalia and to increase transparency for those affected by deportations that have been on uh, previous flights. And I, I will conclude there, but um, I just want to say I'm so glad that we're having this conversation and talking about this and making sure that, you know, we all do something about it. And I think uh, King County did the right thing by ordering an executive order, but um, I think there's more that can be done and it, it feels good to see this room full and with folks who want to do something about this and I'm happy to talk about this more on the panel. Thanks. How's everybody doing? Everybody feeling all right? Um, I just, April is Khmer New Year month, so I just you know want to say uh, which means Happy New Year. So Happy New Year to everybody. Um, um, and also, um, it's uh, it's my girlfriend's birthday, and I, I made her come here with me. So Happy birthday, baby! Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for. Um, yeah, sharing this space with me. I'm, I'm so honored to be here and to be able to be one of the, the folks uh, presenting and speaking and sharing with you guys today. Thank you um, to my fellow pa panelists. Um, um, thank you to um, some of the f uh, affected uh, community members that are in here. Um, there, are, I see several in here, so I'm, I'm blessed that you guys came out um, to hear and then uh, uh, listen and, and, you know, I appreciate that. Um, so, um, as as I was introduced earlier, I'm a 1.5 generation Cambodian, a Khmer American. Um, I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was um, 10 months old in 1981. Uh, I was born in a refugee camp um, where most uh, Cambodians were processed through on the Thai border um, uh, called Kawidang. Um and we fled. Um, um, basically the fallout of um, a conflict that the U.S. was also involved in um, related to the Vietnam War um, that resulted in um, the Cambodian genocide, um, which um, every uh, Cambodian person um, here in, in the U.S. Um, has experienced in some way, shape, or form, whether directly or through um, trauma that has been passed down. Um, I uh, volunteer for an organization called the Khmer Anti-Deportation Advocacy Group of Washington. And um, we're pretty new. We, uh, we formed in uh, late summer of last year, early fall, late summer of last year, as a, um, as a reaction to um, one of the many um, ICE raids into the community. Um, at that time, locally, there were seven uh, Khmer American folks that were picked up uh, in the Seattle Tacoma area, and um, it, I'm personally new to. At, although I have lived experiences and a lot of of, uh, of uh, relationships with folks that have been affected, or know people that have been deported, um, I think um, I am pretty uh, new to the, the 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 directly being involved in the struggle. Um, other core organizers and volunteers for the um, organization, however, have been in the struggle for years. Um, during a time where uh, there wasn't much resources and uh, much access to um, institutions 
or uh, knowledge of how to traverse um, something that uh, you know marginalized communities really have no uh, uh, power over. So um, we came together um, um, to support impacted family members and to really let them know that they really have power if they're able to come together and um, um, be on the front lines to support because, you know, um, Cambodians have been getting deported since 2002. And um, what we've learned over the years is that the most effective way, some of the most effective ways to advocate for uh, community members is by out, being out there and being vocal and having family support. I think oftentimes uh, a lot of people deal with this uh, by themselves, in the shadows. Um, you know, in the community sometimes, you know, people don't want to deal with the fact that family members have been incarcerated or family members um, are going through this um, um, for a myriad of reasons, including, uh, including shame or whatnot. But we came together to really try to like break that thought and, and let them know that there is community, there are community members out here that, that, that really want to help um, I think it took this long because, again, as a, a community as small as the Khmer Cambodian community, we've really, again, struggled to find our place. And, and how, do we, uh, how do we fight as, as small as we are against such a, a big institution that is part of this bigger um, system that profits off of oppression and, um, and, and the inc incarceration of uh, community members? So. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the organization in a bit, but I just wanted to kind of go over, you know, um, um, a short, uh, my short version of uh, how Cambodians got here. Um, so uh, Cambodian Americans in Washington State, uh, we arrived here uh, primarily in the 1980s, uh, during the uh, 80s wave of refugees from um, countries like uh, Laos, um, Vietnam, Cambodia, includes ethnic communities like the Cham, Hmong, me and the Khmu people. Um, uh, there's probably, depending on um, where you look, there's probably between 23 and 26,000 um, people that identify as Cambodian Americans that live in uh, Washington State. Um, Seattle, Tacoma, and Everett are places. Um, most uh, Cambodian folks that I run into are from a, a province in the northwest of the country called uh, Batambang. And um, reason being, and this is my hunch, is that but the Bong uh, is right next to the, the refugee camps. So um, a lot of times, at least in the Northwest, you'll run into people that are from that province. Um, when we came, we were uh, settled, um, I think we were, we were settled in um, really economically marginalized places. So earlier, um, in the introduction, I, I, put, I put that on my Holly baby, and I, I lived there until I was 10 in Holly Park, the, uh, the predecessor to what is New Holly today. Um, Park Lake Homes, which is now Greenbridge, was a really big um, uh, community of Cambodians in White Center. High Point, which still exists. Um, Rainer Vista, um, and then in Tacoma, the Salishan um, projects, and then um, Parkside and Everett. So those are really um, where large pockets of Cambodian Americans um, <clears throat> um, um, uh, stayed at and arrived and built lives. And again, these are really uh, economically marginalized areas. Um, so that, you know, made, it really, made us really susceptible to uh, um, being fed into the school to prison pipeline, to being fed into the uh, prison industrial complex. And it's no wonder that, you know, the way the community sees it is that Incarceration and deportation are almost like one and the same, right? You know, a lot of community members get ICE detainers put on them, regardless of how long they've uh, served time. Um, before they even step foot outside, ICE picks them up. Um, so um, I say all this to say that, um, you know, the idea of resettlement is, is this, is, is, is something I think the community is really trying to still um, realize. Because of the marginalization, I don't quite think that we have been able to really resettle. Um, and we're still in a state of suspension. And being deported is taking us back to a place that was, um, you know, um, bombed heavily, 
that um, a lot of folks had to deal with um, um, genocide at. So, um, you know, the uh, Nixon administration began um, incursions into Cambodia um, in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, um, secretly. And um, um, at the time, Cambodia was a neutral country. Um, they also had uh, uh, bombing operations to um, kind of try to disrupt uh, um, Vietnamese um, troops that were coming into Cambodia. So these were, um, these were among several different campaigns that, um, you know, if you think about it, are uh, war crimes. Um, this was done without the knowledge of Congress. This was done on a neutral country. Um, what happened um, because of those incursions and because of the bombings, um, it created a, a power vacuum. Um, the Khmer Rouge guerrillas that eventually took over in 1975 um, were really small um, throughout the 60s, but um, used the bombing as propaganda. Uh, I, re I recently reunited with an aunt. Um, when I was born in the refugee camps, my mom was too malnourished to uh, produce breast milk. So one of my, my aunts um, that, that happened to have a son around the same time was the one that breastfed me. And we lost contact with her after um, coming to the US and we recently reunited with her a couple years ago. And she grew up in the, the uh, um, a part of the country, Svai Reng, which is next to Vietnam, which saw a brunt of the bombing. And you know, one of the first things I asked her upon meeting her was like, you know, about that, you know, like, so how was it when you were younger? And then she, she, she starts, you know, talking about it, like, you know, whole families gone, um, kids swimming in the, uh, the bomb, you know, the, the blowout, the craters that the bombs created. So um, since, because of, because of those things, uh, the Khmer Rouge was able to uh, use that as propaganda and swell its ranks. Um, in uh, April 17th, 1975 is when the Khmer Rouge uh, rolled into the capital Phnom Penh and um, many Cambodian Americans recognize that as the day, as the beginning of the, the Cambodian genocide. I think just last week, the Khmer Student Association here um, 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 uh, held a vigil called 44 Years of Res Resilience to you know, uh, reflect on that date, but also to uh, celebrate the resilience of the Khmer community here. Um, after, in 1979, Vietnam invaded Cambodia and thus um, in, f freed people from the, uh, the genocide, which um, it, for my family, my mom uh, made her way over to um, Thailand when, where I was born. And uh, Jimmy Carter uh, signed the 1980s Refugee Act, which um, allowed for uh, Cambodians, for Vietnamese, and for Lao folks to come over en masse as refugees. Um, since then, however, you know, uh, our status has kind of been uh, chipped away um, at. Um, we're, uh, most Cambodian folks are green card holders. And I think, again, not having institutional knowledge, not having institutional power to really realizing that uh, green card doesn't mean like your, your permanent resident status doesn't mean you're a permanent resident. So a lot of Cambodian folks didn't know that. We just assumed, including myself, didn't as assume that having a green card was just like citizenship. Um, and then in 1996, uh, the Clinton administration signed the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act um, and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, two really, um, uh, uh, two, two pieces of legislation that really changed um, the status of Cambodian Americans and, and, and like communities like us. Um, some of the, um, the features of these two laws are uh, broadening the definition of the portal offenses, which included misdemeanors like shoplifting or fishing without a license, um, the elimination of judicial, ju judicial discretion, a judge's ability to consider like extenuating factors like if um, you know, removing somebody would uh, disrupt family, uh, f the family's economic livelihood. Um, um, keep in mind that a lot of uh, Khmer um, Cambodian um, communities, the, um, the main breadwinner is a uh, male, and the male is usually the head of household. Um, so those, that, that legislation was kind of the beginning of uh, this process to put us into the crosshairs for removal. 
Um, earlier I talked about how the community is really vulnerable, was really vulnerable and susceptible to, you know, the school to prison pipeline and incarceration. So, so during, concurrently during those times, um, uh, I think a lot of politicians were running on the um, tough on crime uh, platform. Um, in our communities, there was a lot of, uh, again, we were in housing projects and, and, and economically disadvantaged communities. Um, there were a lot of gangs. There's a lot of folks getting into trouble. Um, um, so we saw a lot of community members in the 90s disappear into uh, the criminal justice system. Um, then 9-11 happens. And when 9-11 happens, um, the, 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 the U.S. government starts putting a lot of pressure um, on uh, governments to uh, take, uh, take back um, um, folks that were originally from said countries. And, and in this case, in Cambodia, as a result of 9-11, um, um, uh, the U.S. forced Cambodia into signing an uh, MOU to take back um, uh, Cambodian um, folks. So um, in the 90s, Cambodian folks were already receiving um, orders of removal, but since Cambodia wasn't taking anybody back, uh, a lot of folks just languished in um, um, immigration uh, prisons. Um, so between two starting in 2002, people started to, to be deported. And since then, the community has really just kind of tried to figure its way around and, and, and uh, figure this thing out. Um, being a, such a small community, nobody really hears the stories of Cambodians being deported. Um, I think oftentimes community members or people in public are, are a lot more uh, sympathetic to a story of um, um, a woman on the southern border being uh, that ha had committed no crime, whereas in the Khmer community, a lot of the reason a lot of folks are being deported is because they have these old, old order removals from the 90s. Um, so since then, we've been really trying to struggle how to figure out how to um, deal with this because today, most folks that are being deported have orders of removals from the 90s. So 20 years later, they've came out, they've, uh, um, they've um, changed their lives, they've had families, they have jobs, they have businesses. And all of a sudden, they get picked up and taken away just like that. Um, just to kind of um, paint a picture of um, how Cambodian Americans are kind of lost in the shuffle and kind of hidden, um, I, I, I think, I don't, I don't know if a lot of people have heard the model minority myth. I think we suffer a lot from that because um, a lot of data is uh, disaggregated and people see us as kind of folks that kind of benefit from, uh, from the system. But um, looking back at um, some statistics from um, Washington State um, Cambodian folks, you know, 82%, 82% of um, uh, Cambodian American students qualify for free lunch. 60% live in a single parent home. 40.5% speak English less than um, well compared to 8% of the total. Um, and this is um, data from 2013 through CRAC, which is a national organization that um, I'm focused on Southeast Asian communities. 37% um, have less than a high school degree. 14% with, uh, uh, with a bachelor's compared to the national average of almost 30%. And then within the Asian American community, 49%. I say all this to say that we really haven't been a we, we're really a community that hasn't been able to really set our foot down and really plan ourselves um, um, the way um, uh, a lot of communities have had. So that um, combined with the fact that um, we're not seen or we're not heard makes us really uh, susceptible to uh, being um, uh, treated um, this way by ICE. You know, it's kind of no, it's kind of no surprise that I think, you know, the U.S. government, like, pushed Cambodia to accept an MOU first and foremost. Um, so, what, so what does that all mean? Um, so deportation in the uh, Khmer community uh, still continues. Um, there's an estimated 200 in the Washington state that are in danger of removal, 1,900 nationally. And I know those are small numbers compared to other communities, but we're a really small community in itself. Um, almost 2,000 folks have been deported since the MOU has been established. Um, looking at the report that um, 
team here has compiled in the, the, the ERO um, line item. Um, 29 folks were uh, deported in 2017, and then um, that jumped to 110 last year. That's a, that's a really big jump um, um, from 29 to 110. And 29, not, I, I don't have the average in front of me, but that was kind of like kind of the normal um, amount of uh, total deportations um, um, nationwide. Um, most of the people that are uh, affected are people with um, old orders of deportation. And um, it's nobody that, oh, I can't say nobody, but a lot of folks are folks that are just, have been checking in for decades and it's became part of their lives and that's just routine. And then one day they just get uh, picked up. So what is CAGE doing now? So CAGE, or the Kamai Anti-Deportation Advocacy Group of Washington, um, came together, or as I said earlier, came together um, last summer, fall, and we kind of, you know, came together and really tried to put our heads together and um, uh, leverage resources. As I said before, some um, organizers and volunteers are affected community members that have been doing the work for a very long time. Uh, some of the folks are, um, are sitting in office or have relationships in the governor's office. Some folks, um, like myself, um, um, have relationships in press. So what we, um, seven folks were picked up last year, and we were able to directly help um, two folks uh, um, not be put on the plane. Um, and so that involved um, working with uh, Governor Inslee's office. I, for the first time in uh, Washington state history, um, we were able to, uh, or I'm sorry, Governor Inslee skipped over the um, clemency and pardons process totally and um, released uh, a man named Ruth Ann. Um, the first time that's ever been done in Washington state because he was days away been, from being put on a plane. Um, I saw family members that usually don't come out um, stand up for uh, their loved ones. And um, I'm not sure if she's here, but she told me she was gonna be here. But um, there is a, a community member who, who um, when we figured out that nothing was gonna happen um, um, through, through the governor's office, we went to the press. And she, was, and, and she stepped up and, and got in front of the camera and told her story. And um, so these are the type of things we're doing, right? Like, before that, we weren't really sure how, uh, how to do things, or what the strategy would be. But now we've kind of, you know, came together and tried to um, leverage all the resources we have through press, through relationships. Um, and that's still happening, right? We don't, still don't have answers, per se, but um, we're still working on it. I think that um, some strategies going forward are continuing to leverage partnerships on a national level and to try to pivot to a more proactive approach and not depend on pardons all the time, which is a really taxing prog uh, process, um, to let community members know that there is a process that you can do. It's a, um, for folks that are facing um, orders of removal, uh, it would, it's always better to um, take a look at um, um, pardons or undoing certain uh, uh, things that make your case deportable. I, I think there was another gentleman that um, he didn't know, but when, when, when he came to see us, we were able to put him with um, pro bono legal advocates that helped undo his um, charge in the first place because he had um, uh, pled guilty to a crime um, that he didn't know he would be deportable for. So it's, it's a really messy process, but we are beginning to put together a structure that um, can help folks um, navigate the system. Um, locally, there has been four uh, Cambodian um, Americans that have been um, pardoned nationally, 15. Um, next steps, um, you know, I thank the, um, I thank, was it Task Force D? <laughs> Task Force D, I thank, thank you so much because that's a, a prime example of, you know, people in a, a position of privilege or with institutional power that can make a difference. And I think, you know, um, in terms of what anybody can do, it's just that. Um, a few months ago, um, Dina Bernstein, who's with um, the Interfaith Migrants Rights Network, she showed up through direct action to be at um, ICE facilities when somebody was turning them, themselves in. Again, a lot of times it's support for p folks that think they're uh, um, by themselves. So um, I really 
implore folks here that if, if, if they want to make a difference, a lot of times it's just, you know, in your own, in your own space and in your own zone. These flights take off because a lot of folks think they're just a cog in the wheel and they're just like, you know, I can't do anything about it. I'm just a guy that flies a plane or just takes out the garbage or whatever the case may be. What is it, what, what is it that you can do in your own space if not directly engage or come into the scene? Because really, what we're trying to do is really liberate ourselves and we can't liberate ourselves if we can't liberate everybody. So. You know, I, I, you know if, if someone was to ask me what you could do, I'd really say that. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks in a privileged position are white. And just look at the space that you have and look at the, 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 your, your ability to um, pull the levers and see what you can do within your space because those things just um, can echo um, um, across um, spaces. Um, that's as much as I have. Sorry for rambling on. But before I go, I just want to acknowledge uh, Manny Uch in the building. He, um, he's one of the core organizers, and, that's, and he's an affected community member who was, uh, uh, you know, been going through this process since the 90s. Um, and uh, the good news is that his or order of deportation has been finally lifted. So congratulations, Manny. Thank you. Good evening. Um, yeah, hi. My name is Maru Moravillal Pando. And yay, <laughs> that's me. And I'm part of La Resistencia, uh, formerly known as NWDC Resistance. We made it easy for all of you to remember our name, La Resistencia. Um, so I want to start by saying, <coughs> Yes, thank you to the collaboration with Angelina and all the students. I think this report, it's, it shows when groups and people come together in a respectful, professional, committed way. You know, we've been working with Angelina for some years now, and uh, we've, doing, we've done some, some projects, and uh, this, this is one of those that uh, it was better than we expected. So, um, and I, I wanna make sure that when we think of deportation flights, we remember that we're talking about detention and the potentials all together throughout the nation. And as uh, I was mentioned at the beginning, m our work as La Resistencia is to end all detentions and all deportations, period. But we're gonna focus right now on, on uh, King County flights. So everybody knows King County said that um, their sanctuary, Seattle is sanctuary, yet we still see you know, so many deportations being uh, happening here in, in King County Airport as the report just uh, presented. Um, we see uh, that Dow Constantine, the same person that, you know, surprisingly set up a, a press conference yesterday without telling really any of us, uh, that uh, he has some zero youth detention policy, yet we have this large building in um, 12th and Lander that they're building to incarcerate youth. That's why I'm wearing this. And we have these offices uh, uh, in uh, 1212 Avenue, actually it's 1002nd Avenue, sorry. That's messed up. 1002nd Avenue, um, and we continue hearing of ICE going outside courthouses and arresting people. So how can we say that we actually are in a sanctuary county, in a sanctuary city, you know, that supposedly we also have a renewed executive order from Inslee himself in 2017, and we still see a state patrol uh, stopping people and sending them to ICE during a traffic stop. So all of this is hypocrisy. And so we cannot continue saying that this is a sanctuary city, a sanctuary county, or a sanctuary state whatsoever, when the reality shows completely different situations. You know, the most surprising thing about all the data and all the information that the students and Angelina got was the fact that when people are deported, they're not seen as passengers because they didn't buy a ticket. No. So you hear like Ralph Nader talking about passenger rights, right? Well, because you bought your ticket. But in our case, if we get deported, we're not even seen as passengers, we're seen as cargo. Talk about slavery coming back. And um, 
I just grabbed pictures from the internet. Really, it didn't take me long to find pictures of the, the shackles. There's a ton of them. And that shows you how common this is. It's just incredible the level of violence that our families are going through, that individuals are going through when deportation happens. Um, This picture caught my eye, and I'm sorry, it's not like really good quality. Again, I just grabbed it from the internet. But um, see how the, this person getting into the plane is just, you know, facing down. This is this is kind of what we face when we get calls from the detention center and when we talk to families. ICE is expecting us to just look down, to give up to just do whatever they tell us, to believe what they tell us. So there's constant violence, physical violence, but there's also the violence of constant oppression that we've been facing for so many centuries, and that ICE has so many easy ways to inflict upon us, that even on the way out, people still feel there's no solution to, to our problems, that somehow we deserve this. And this is happening here in King County. I think that for us, when we start looking at deportation flights, the first thing we thought was, well, what about international human rights? You know, what about, doesn't, doesn't that apply? <laughs> well, you know, we've done a lot of work with Professor uh, Alejandra Gonza that is here from the International Human Rights Clinic, and we were just celebrating that um, the work that we've done with her um, show now the, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, did that report recently in, in the testimonies that we have presented uh, thanks to her work and her students here at the UW. But then it makes you wonder, aren't we supposed to be accountable also to the inter international community? <laughs> well, yeah, it makes you laugh because it seems that we're not. Um, yet, Alejandra and I were talking this morning, and usually the U.S. had been seen in the past by the international community as the place where human rights are, are whole, right? That the, the, the access to information is available. And this is the first time through this work of uh, the Center for Human Rights and International Human Rights Clinic, we're showing no, the United States is not that place. Even we say that to people detained when they call us, especially people from Cuba, uh, <laughs> You know, they call us and they say, oh, they told me this is the land of freedom and I've been detained for so many months. And I said to them, well, they lied to you. Um, so what we see as La Resistencia, our work is to expose the machine, right? It's to expose all these lies. It's to expose how the machine is, su is sustained by a, an infrastructure that relies on localities. So let me give you an example. June of 2018, the June 3rd of 2018, I believe, we decided to shut down uh, Second Avenue. Uh, some people got stuck in traffic, and well, you know, aren't you stuck in traffic in Seattle anyway? <laughs> All the time. So no, I don't know why people complain about it that day. Um, but we did it because we believed that we needed to, to call attention to the fact that ICE is in uh, 1000 Second Avenue, Homeland Security Investigations is there, and they continue working with Seattle Police Department. But supposedly they're not. So we decided to do this. We shut down the street, we got this action happen. Uh, there were arrests, people were released that day. That was a Tuesday. By Thursday, there's the news that Families have been separated at the border, and 200 women have been sent to SeaTac. So we decided to uh, switch our Solidarity Day that happens uh, every month at SeaTac. We switched to, uh, uh, I mean, to, that happens at NWDC. We switched to SeaTac. So we had less than 48 hours to put everything together. We have never done a Solidarity Day there. Uh, have people been at the SeaTac? Federal Detention Center, some, okay. So you s it's very challenging to do actions there because there's no like a space for, for pedestrians. Uh, CTAC is also a city known uh, that, you know, the mayor is uh, a Trump lover. I think somebody called them that way. Um, they, that CTAC police does collaborate with ICE as well. So we were 
uh, facing the challenge of we're going to do an action, we don't know how many people are going to show, and we don't know if there's going to be arrests. So we really had to do a lot of work to ensure that we were um, able to, to provide safety to people that are right. What we didn't know, and we, we announced, we're going on Saturday, 1.30, show up. What we didn't know is that all these politicians, these Facebook people in Seattle, decided to do a press conference before us. So we call uh, an action at 1.30, they show up at noon, without telling us. Same thing as, as yesterday, without telling us. So it's, it's this idea of, are they just taking advantage of us? Do they like the photo op? I believe so. Yes, thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> um, and so while we had nine courage, courageous people shutting down the street, being arrested, released the same day on Tuesday with no charges, then we have this politician showing up on Saturday, including Dan Constantine, saying, I'm going to do everything in my power to stop the, detain the deportation flights in King County. And we're like, oh, how? Um, then we didn't hear anything, crickets, right? For months, crickets. And at the same time as we're exposing this machine, what happens is that in the city of Seattle, um, the, the city uh, attorney decides to set uh, charges against the uh, nine people that shut down the street. So right now we're facing that. You know, we have politicians showing up to a CTAC action, saying we are really progressive, we won't let this happen. And instead of, instead of fighting the deportation machine, instead of fighting the infrastructure that Trump is taking advantage of, they decide to fight us. And they decide to put charges against our people, and they don't want to drop them. So we continue exposing this machine. Um, and we have actually, uh, work with several groups, and some of you are present here, throughout this, the state um, on how this machine operates not only in King County. We know that now Jackie might supposedly know detaining people, supposedly, because they were made not to, because they lost a lawsuit, but they're still doing it. We, Montserrat is like, yeah, of course, we know. Um, <laughs> and, and this is a, a graphic that we put together um, last year because we wanted to showcase this is not only a Seattle problem, right? It's a, it's a Washington state problem. But how deep it goes, we still don't know. But we need to make sure that people are aware of what's happening and how each of those localities are responsible for those numbers, right? For every person that's a life is disrupted, those localities has to do something with it. And they should be also held accountable, not only ICE. But in our experience with this report and trying to engage with uh, King County authorities, what we'll learn is that localities just pass the buck. Let me give you an example. This is a, a sign that was in the, in the door of the entrance to uh, the Northwest Detention Center last year uh, in September. Mm. Can you all read this? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a warning. If you come in, you, know, you might be exposed to chicken pox. So if you want to come in, that's your problem. Um, so in, in uh, the NWDC, we had um, two uh, outbreaks of chicken pox last year, one right after the other one, and then moms. And uh, we went to city of Tacoma and said, this is happening, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, that's Geo's problem. And if you talk to Geo, they're like, that's ICE's problem. And if ICE, they blame everybody else. And so uh, you talk to the Department of Health, they're like, you know, we're, only if, this, if Geo let us in, but last uh, inspection they had, everything was fine. They don't have to report anything to us if they don't want. So they're really good at just, you know, passing the buck. And it felt the same way with King County because it turns out like even if you read their the executive order, they're like, we didn't know. We just didn't know. You know June, June 2018, all of a sudden, what? There's deportations? <laughs> what? How did that happen? Let me tell you, in 2014, when we did our first shutdown action, that was February 24 of 2014. That was a Tuesday. There was a reason why we did it on a Tuesday. Because that's the day deportations happen. And we're talking about 2014 when we came up with this. And it's 2019, and you ask the county, and they say, what? Deportations happen on Tuesday? We had no idea. <laughs> so you know, I think that we're used to having to deal with localities that don't want to face reality, but it's uh, it makes us angry when they think they were stupid, because we're not. 
And we're angry, and I think you should be angry too. This is the statement of a good friend of mine that I met in the detention center, Ricardo. He used to call me almost every day. And uh, he had horrible medical problems, still does. He was deported. But sometimes, and most of the times that he called me, he never talked about his own problems. He would talk about other people's problems, right? And so what uh, he kept saying to me was, how do we stop all this? You know, when I, when I leave this place, I want to join Resistencia, but how do we do it? He ended up being deported. And uh, as this report was being put together, we were able to locate him. He's been in touch with us. And he said to me, um, can I share my story? I think that least, that's the least I can do, and I should do. So this is a quote from him. Um, he's pretty much describing things were horrible in the detention center. I can tell you so many stories about him and his medical condition. But to say, even the deportation process in itself, the flight, is also horrible. Like, why? We're already leaving. <coughs> why do you have to treat us this way? His deportation flight, in summary, was three stops. And every stop, they have to get up from the, air, uh, the plane and come back because they were adding more people as every stop happened. And he was handcuffed like everybody else. And as you come back into the plane, he said, every time guards will tell us, you're scum of the earth. You're trying to take our jobs. I'm so glad you're leaving my country. I don't want to see you ever again. And those are the nice way I can put it and the way they talk to him. So every time they, they were brought in into the airplane, they were the same kind of humiliation they had to go through. So it was three stops. And then the, there was a layover for a night in what he described a detention center inside, a, inside an airport. And then in the morning at 5.30, goes into the plane again for another three stops, and then finally to his destination. So that really took two days for him to go from the US to El Salvador, all the way there. As uh, people were talking about the, Soma the Somalia uh, nightmare of that, that flight that we know, uh, we actually were in touch with a person that was in that flight, a person that was here in Tacoma from, from Somalia. Uh, he was deported there. Uh, and he called call us back when, they, when that flight came, back, came back to Miami. So he called us and he said, you have no idea what I just went through. <laughs> and I was like, I think I just read it. Um, so he told us, you know, he told us the, the entire hours, how they were lied, the reasons why they were sitting there for so many hours, why they came back. And all I can tell you what is stuck in my mind, that the, the textual part that it stuck in my mind was, um, he said it was like hell in the sky. That's how he described it. So if we know all the violence that our communities are going through, we know how this violence is being inflicted upon us. If anybody reads the report or you know, sees this, they would be shocked. But how easy it is to talk about things that you're going to do, but how hard it's actually to do so. So this, this is a quote from the press uh, release that was sent out yesterday uh, from uh, Daoud Konstantin uh, press conference. And he says that, yeah, you know, they're going to attempt to do something. And that we are welcoming to all people. Uh, how nice that, that looks like. But what are the actions? And I'm glad that Angelina uh, explained in very simple ways uh, how those actions it's going to look like we don't know. It's not clear. Um, so I don't know you, but I mean, people can talk and talk and talk. I'm more of an action person. And I think most of you know that in our group, that's what we do, right? We don't, we only get to talk like this when we're invited. Usually we don't. Uh, <laughs> um, but let me tell you that even if, if somehow uh, oh, you know that there's a bill that just passed and is going to be signed by the governor Keep, uh, called the Keep Washington Working Bill? It's a bill that <laughs> actually, uh, it took seven years to get to this point. We started back in 2012 and, you know, with Democrats in power and it still took us seven years. See how frustrated I am with politicians? Um, 
So as this is signed and, and hopefully implemented, because we'll still have to see the implementation, that does not guarantee that this detention center won't have people being brought into King County Airport to be detained. Because as of now, at least half of the population in NWDC are people that uh, were detained in the southern border. So if this bill actually is implemented and we see less detentions in Washington state, we will see an increase of people being brought to the airport in uh, Boeing Field to be detained because they're coming from the southern border. So I think that's really critical to understand. And let me just give you a, a hint of how things are in, in WDC right now. Since uh, March 15, we have received uh, at least 14 reports of maggots in the food. So for over a month now, we, we have constant reports of people saying that beans, chicken, and fruit, they constantly find maggots uh, alive. So because we asked, so how do you know, you know, have you seen them? How do they look like? Um, and they said, well, they're moving. You know, I look at my beans and something was moving in it. Uh, somebody just cut a piece of chicken and they were there. Mm. And so I asked a woman one day, uh, one of like a week ago or so, a have you seen maggots? Because we're not asking now everybody, right? Have you seen maggots? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you remember when it happened? Just this morning. Um, well, where did you find them? In the fruit. But you know, that's not as, I mean, yeah, once in a while we get them. What we get all the time in the food is hairs. And so that is what people are facing in the detention center right now. And let me remind you, NWDC is supposed to be the top facility across the nation. I sell this place as their top facility in the nation. So imagine how the rest of them are. And why it's so critical for us to help people uh, like, like Dr. Constantine accountable to his words. Because, excuse me, but if you're gonna talk about my community and if you open your mouth, you better do what you say you're gonna do. Otherwise, we're gonna keep you <laughs> in check and don't start crying when we're coming after you. As Dow Constantine was have a, having a press conference at 3 p.m. in King County Airport, I went to the detention center and I took these pictures. This is the parking lot uh, where uh, buses and their patrols are uh, sitting throughout the day. Usually that's full. If you've ever been to the detention center, you will see that at least five buses, like those two right there on the, le on the right, Yes, you're right. Um, usually there's five of them, but there were only two there. And there's all the other smaller um, buses. But as you can see, that's full. I was driving as I took these, so they're not like the best pictures. Uh, so I tried to zoom in, and there they are, just those buses. And I, I realized, OK, yeah, it's Tuesday. It's deportation day. So as he was uh, speaking, it was a deportation day. How many people were taken from NWDC to be deported? And the, sh the case that we don't see enough buses there tells you where are those buses, right? And so um, as I was leaving the detention center, I saw another bus coming in, and I turned around, and I tried to catch another picture of it. So that bus that you see there kind of turning around, it tells us that it's empty because it's going into the parking lot. So these buses were li leaving King County Airport and coming back into the detention center empty. Today, uh, one of our colleagues went back again and she saw buses leaving the parking lot, which means now they're gonna go get new people from other places to bring into the detention center. Because that detention center, as it was mentioned, it has a uh, minimum guarantee of 800 beds. The maximum capacity is 1,575. It's not convenient for us just to bring 800 people, right? So they keep it at capacity. Um, and so that's another shot just to show you uh, that pretty much is empty and the bus is going in. So what is it that we're asking for? Like I say, we, we are uh, finding again and again how private corporations benefit from our misery. Um, again and again, GEO is one of them. It was mentioned, uh, all these n n new names that we have to learn, modern, air, and uh, what was the other one? Clay Lacy. Clay Lacy. Remember that, because you're going to need to remember that. 
Um, and so for them to operate, they, ne they need the local infrastructure. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to operate. And so what we want King County is to stop colluding with gross violations of people's humanity. Because they are. They can claim they didn't know. Let's say they, they actually didn't know. It doesn't matter. They're doing it. And that's the problem. And if they didn't know, well, they know now. <laughs> so let me tell you, when Angelina and us started looking at all this data, we realized this was something huge that we needed to do. La Resistencia, we're all volunteers. We have a lot of work to do. Um, good thing that uh, hunger strikes have not happened this year here in Tacoma, but we have been supporting hunger strikes in other places across the nation. But we realized that, you know, there was no coincidence that we do a shutdown of uh, the street outside ICE offices in downtown, then the announcement of the zero tolerance policy, and then politicians coming out and talking about, you know, how horrible that is. I think that what we want to make sure is that if any, any county official, any elected official really feels bad about this, they really believe this is horrible, they should be working with us. They should not just take in advantage. They sh this should not, not should, shouldn't be a, a photo moment, right? I think that was, it was clear for, for us in that press conference and the e executive order is that there was an urgency. Yes, we agree there's an urgency. But it's different the type of urgency. The urgency that Dow Constantine found himself in and the urgency that we find ourselves in. Um, we want a, a concrete plan, how this is going to happen. And we want a real timeline by when. Because as it was found in the little access that <laughs> Angelina had to information, it turns out that uh, contracts um, or these agreements, I'm sorry, they're called agreements, uh, with uh, these companies that are uh, leasing these spaces in the airport uh, last 35 years. And one of the main ones, Clay Lacey, uh, lasts for 35 years. And according to the little information that we have, it was recently renewed. So when Ka Dow Constantine says that he's uh, banning these leases, by when? Are we going to wait 35 years? Sorry, we can't wait that long. So we want a real timeline to end those leases. And we want full transparency of, on details. Because something that we realized that uh, the little information that uh, King County was given, uh, it was also the fact that either they, they, they didn't know or they don't want to know. Either way, there should be a transparent process to all of this. And how come they're announcing <laughs> audits now? How come they didn't do it in the past? I mean, it's just obvious that something had to be done there. Um, and they have to understand that we cannot allow for uh, expansion or new permits if the, this, this the deportation um, flights are going to actually end. I think that for us, uh, going back to the emergency, the emergency for us is that this week is 15 years since the detention center opened, mm. this week. 15 years is too many years. For, to me, it sounded that Dow Constantine's urgency is his image and his political career. And that is not something that we're going to allow. We're asking you to help us in ensuring that what the county da actually does, if they do it, should follow these um, specific uh, demands. How do we do it? Well, as I say, we are people of action. And what we're asking you to do is to call him. Call Dow Constantine. There's the phone number. 206-263-9600. I'm going to repeat that for all of you. 206-263-9600. There's a voicemail. We tested it. It works. <laughs> I, I think it still today works. Uh, we tested it last night. Call him and tell him, um, yeah, we don't, want we don't want to wait 35 years for this to happen. We're giving you 35 days. And we're being 
really nice. 35 days, starting today. So make sure that, um, let us know if they answer the phone, let us, let us know if you were able to leave a voicemail, let us know if uh, they get back to you or something. Tell him, we're counting the days. You have 35 days. No more, no less. We're being nice. <coughs> we could have said less again, but we're gonna stick with the 35. Um, because again, as he was uh, speaking, people had already took off from King County to be deported. Just now, when one of the, the panelists were speaking, I was getting a text from a family member saying, my son is getting deported next week. So this is something that should have been done years ago. Doug Constantine should not wait for his political career to take off. If he really, truly cares about this, he would have done it on June 2018. But why did he wait for the day before of this, this uh, release of this uh, report? I think that there's, uh, that's easy to understand. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.